I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. So, Dick, thanks a lot for, for coming on the show. Glad to do it. You know, I want to ask you actually why you do it. Like you're 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 running an enormous company. Um, it's the the oldest brewery in America, though, and the largest American owned brewery in America, the largest privately owned brewery in America. You're a busy guy. Like why why do a podcast? I'm always curious about this. Why do I do it? Yes. Listen, I I started in 1958, and I remember the years that that. Uh, we were all but out of business. Actually, my father and his brother had the place sold back in the 60s, and they found out that the uh, the purchaser was going to scrap it, and and then they didn't sell it to him. Well, thank God they didn't. But, you know, all the small breweries, there were so many coal region breweries back in those days in the 50s and 60s. Uh, every town almost had had its own brewery, and they were all going out of business at that time, and we were pretty close to it. And, uh, you know, we hung in there. They, uh, my dad and his brother bought the company in 1963 from my grandfather who passed away at 80 some years old. So he was still running it. And, uh, you know what? They, they kept investing some money in it and kept the thing alive. And, uh, look what happened. You know, you give yourself a chance and, uh, you never know what's going to happen. There's this craft beer craze and Jim Cook, uh, with the Samuel Adams and introduce people to better beers and, and uh, a guy like us is that's, that's our portfolio. But, but, but why, um, you know, now obviously you, you, you've grown, you, you've personally grown it into a successful company and we'll talk about into an enormously successful company. It was or obviously it's already been successful. It's been around almost 200 years, but like, why do a podcast? You're, you're, you're obviously incredibly busy. Why come on my show? Because you asked me, that's why. Oh, okay, I don't good. Anybody's show. I <laughs> Thank go on you. the Johnny Carson show if he's still at it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, well, well, here's here's there's a couple of questions I want to ask you, but you brought up something very interesting. Your dad bought the business from your grandfather. Now that's an unusual statement. I don't know if people kind of caught that, but most of the time. Children inherit businesses from their father. So, so why did they? And I know you bought from your father too. So this is like a family tr tradition. Why did your father buy from your grandfather? Why did you buy from your father? 
as opposed to inheriting well, the business? It, it, well, because, Jim, it generally comes out of a, uh, an estate and, you know, the, if he's the owner of the brewery, uh, the money that he would generate goes into his estate and, and the other members of the family are entitled to something out of that. And uh, I see it the same way. So you, 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 there's an evaluation on the on the brewery from the government, and uh, you know it's part of his estate, so you have to pay tax on it. And so somebody's got to pay that. So when you buy it, uh, it goes into your estate eventually. And the uh, same thing will happen to me if I cash in, and uh, uh, you know the company will go into my estate, and one one or two of my children will will buy it, and that's. The way it works. I see. So, so it's kind of like uh, for for tax planning purposes. So, your family can have control over what happens instead right. of saying outside forces having control over it. Well, no outside forces would because we're not. We're, we own, I own a hundred percent of the stock in the company, and eventually my children will too. Now, most there, there's this saying: um, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Uh, meaning, you know, somebody will start a business. Their son will continue it, and then the third generation will usually ruin it. But now your your daughters will be the sixth generation running this business. The business was started in 1829, and your your daughters will be the sixth generation. How do you kind of keep – how did your family in general kind of keep the work ethic going to keep this business alive? Well, I can't speak for the the past members of the family because they're not here anymore, but everybody took an interest in it, apparently, just like I did. I mean, I, I wanted to be involved in the brewery from the time I was 16, 17 years old. I, I was fascinated by it. I thought we had great products. Uh, uh, even though we were struggling, uh, we were up against such stiff local competition uh, to try to remain uh uh, financially solvent, but you know, somebody always picked up the ball and, and, uh, uh, took, took over the company. And it, it goes back to my great, great, my great grandfather and my grandfather who, who bought it when he was, uh, oh, he was a freshman at Princeton when his father passed away and he came back and took over the brewery. I don't think he ever did graduate from Princeton. And, uh, you know, he ran it from 1899 till, 1963 when he passed away and my father and his brother both worked at the brewery. I mean, they, it was dismal times at that time, but they had the, enough character and interest in the, in the company to take it over and, and keep it alive. And, you know, I don't know what I'd have done if, if, uh, they would have sold it, but, well, uh, we got very lucky in the, uh, in the uh, 1980s, late 1980s, 1990, uh, I won't say we were lucky, but we, we were in the right place at the right time, which I guess is luck. And, uh, we had good products and, you know, we went from 137,000 barrels when I bought it, to we should be close to 3 million barrels this year. And that, and that not makes you me now, Jim, it's not just me. It's, it's all the people that work here. Uh, you feel it's a, this is a small co-region community and, uh, people depend on this company for their livelihood and, there's people that have built us and put us into the uh, position that we're in today. Uh, our salespeople, uh, our COO, Dave Casanelli. Uh, we, we got we got very fortunate that I got good people in here. Well, it's interesting though. How do you like in a family business? One challenge is is to keep good employees incentivized because they know they're never going to be the CEO, they know they're never going to run the whole business. How do you keep employees still feeling like creative and innovative and, and wanting to grow within the business? Well, you pay them. <laughs> Pretty simple. You know, they're, they're a part of this. And uh, I think they take ownership to their jobs and uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, they have the good product to sell. Uh, we treat them like part of the family. We try to. That's great. So, so now, 1899 to 1963, you said your your grandfather ran the business. That's a long. That's 64 years. That's a long time to do one thing. Like, yes. do you think yes. he ever got bored? Like, did he ever sort of wander off into the caves and do something else? Well, he did. Uh, don't forget, he went through the uh, prohibition period, 
And uh, oh yeah, what did you what did you do well, during that well, period? We, we kept operating. We kept the brewery operating. And in 1920, he uh, built a, a, a creamery, a dairy across the street, and he made ice cream and sold milk. And uh, one of his uh, uh, sons that wasn't in, involved in the brewery took that over eventually, probably in the 30s or early 40s. Some, uh, I don't know what year it was, but somewhere around there, he bought the dairy from my grandfather and and he ran a very successful uh, ice cream manufacturing company. And my grandfather also got involved at that time. Uh, you're talking about the roaring 20s. Uh, dance halls were... were uh, becoming uh, very prominent, and, and uh, he invested in, in dance halls in Philadelphia, Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, in New York, he had he was a partner in Roseland, which most people don't remember anymore. I don't even know if it's still open. But Oh, no, I, I, uh, I used to go there. This is like in the 90s. I would go on uh, dates there. There would be music playing and you dance. Okay, well, the, the girl that owned it at that time in the 90s was the daughter or granddaughter of my grandfather's partner. And I think her name was Betz, B-E-T-Z, but I'm not sure. Uh, uh, she still owned it uh, back in the 1990s. Now, you know, that's that's what he did. He, he had an investment, and he eventually sold his shares out probably before the... 1929 when the market crashed he got he's a very smart businessman he was he was a smart guy he invested in real estate and uh, and also the dance halls the dairy so he he did uh, do some di uh, di diversification he was also uh, president of a a local bank so he, he was he was into different things and uh, probably uh, prohibition forced him into it yeah, interesting. So that kind of that kind of kept the variety going. In some sense, that's the probably the way you avoided the shirt sleeves to sh shirt sleeves expression was by keeping variety in the business. That's right. No, that's correct. Now, even you left the business for a while. You went and um, d formed. You left the business and formed a distributorship for a while. Like, what was going on between you and your dad that you didn't stay fully at the business while he was still running it? Well, I, I was pretty forceful, and now I was a kid at the time. You know, I was in my 20s, and I wanted to modernize the brewery. I felt we had a chance for survival, and I wanted to modernize the brewery and, and make it run more efficiently. And uh, uh, you know what? In all fairness to him, he didn't have the money to do a lot of the things that I wanted to do. The funny thing is that <clears throat> after I left, uh, he did the things I wanted him to do, so uh, we 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 didn't see eye to eye on on how we wanted to keep the uh, company alive. But uh, you know, I I don't blame him. Anybody can spend somebody else's money, and that's basically what I was asking him to do: is spend money to to modernize the brewery and make it run more efficiently. Now, now I'm I'm doing that on my own. Now, now, well, I don't even, I don't know. This is a naive question because I don't know much about breweries. But how do you modernize a brewery? Like, what was going on? How, how did you? What did you want to spend the money on? Well, I want. First of all, we did everything by hand in those days. We loaded trucks, unloaded trucks by hand. It was all almost all returnable bottles. It was uh, everything from seven ounce returnable bottles to quarts. Uh, we had. 12 ounce returnable, 16 ounce returnable bottles. And it was just a very inefficient operation in that we were handling everything by hand. And I, I wanted to uh, build a warehouse in an area that we had and, and palletize the operation so we could load distributors uh, and customers with, uh, with forklifts rather than by hand. And, you know, he, he, he he was one of those people that said, well, we've always done it this way, and you, know, you couldn't get him away from that. Today we do, we've, uh, we, or we wouldn't be here today. Well, when you bought the business, though, it was like, not that it was in danger of going out of business, but you definitely bought it at a low point in 1985. Like, do, do you attribute that a little bit to his reluctance to kind of modernize fast enough? Well, he was making he was making money. He wasn't, he was, he was keeping his head above water financially in the, in the mid eighties when he got sick, he got Alzheimer's and that's kind of why he mm. got out of the business. And, uh, but he, it, it was, it was, it was just, uh, he, I'm a production nut. I mean, I, I enjoyed working in the packaging operation and I saw that we had to, uh, 
uh, run our run our products at higher speeds. Uh, we're, more and more people were buying cans. I wanted to get a bigger and more modern can feller and 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 uh, run cans at a greater speed. Uh, when I started there, we were running cans at 210 cans a minute. Today we're running in Florida. We're running 1,200 a minute. Up here we're running 900 cans a minute. And uh, that's pretty six. 36 cases per minute that you were getting off the machines. And that, that's yeah. by industry standards. That's, that's not really that fast, but it's as much as our plant can handle. And you can't do any better than, you know, what you, uh, what you can make in a day. You can't do, we can't make that much beer in a day. Well, it's funny, you know, you, so, so Yingling beer is again, uh, I guess you're the largest privately owned, uh, brewery in America. Uh, how do you, how do you stay such a cult favorite and at the same time be a mass favorite? Like you're the largest. So it's kind of an interesting, not too many companies are both cult and mass. Uh, it, well, it's kind of a simple answer. We make good beer and, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we had a brewmaster here when I took over, uh, in 1985 he, he had been here since the end of the second world war and wow. he just had old brewing standards uh cleanliness uh good products he sampled everything made sure it was proper uh, uh tasted proper uh properly going out in the marketplace and and today i mean he's gone uh in the 90s he retired and eventually passed away but uh uh, he set the standards by which we still operate today is the easiest way to put it. The other thing is, you know, you say, uh, how do we maintain our cult? Well, good beer is one thing. The other thing is all the national brands who are 85% of the beer sales in the United States, uh, which is Bud Miller and Coors, are all internationally owned. And I think the consumer realizes that. Uh, Another ten percent of the beer business is 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 foreign made beer. Uh, your Coronas and and Heineken and whatnot that comes into this country, and I think people respect the fact that we stuck it out and uh, we're family owned and operated. And my my kids understand that. We have a a museum and gift shop, and we have tours in the old brewery, and and people are just enthralled when they come in and go through the the plant. I mean, it's it's an old coal region brewery and and it's uh, a very good one it's small but it's very good we'll put up almost half a million barrels out of there this year and you know, uh you know they they see they see uh, the caves that they dug back in the 18 uh 29 1830 era uh to store the beer i mean you know remember we started before there was even electricity <clears throat> everything was done by gravity and uh, <laughs> people come in and see that and i think that that's a big piece of our, our, our selling point is the, the fact that we've survived with such an old plant through all these years. You know, beer is sort of a funny industry because, you know, arguably it's one of the oldest industries in history. Like there, there's a theory that um, society was domesticated because we needed to learn how to harvest wheat for beer, not the other way around. So like beer essentially created modern civilization so, so it's like you never have to worry about going out of business <laughs> well I, I don't know about that but uh you, you know the big guys are, are really clamping down on us uh you have a very difficult time sometimes getting your beer to the consumer through your wholesaler network and uh through a consolidation there's not a lot of wholesalers left to uh uh to go to to uh market your product our brand does happen to be one of the close to our size so wait, uh, um i missed that last part so so if if the distributorships decide to, that they're not going to carry you anymore are, does that put you in trouble or can you own a distributorship no we 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 wouldn't want to own a, a distributorship that that's not uh, that, that's their job. We give them our brand and we expect them to go sell it. And it's, uh, sometimes it just gets to be a problem because they're, they're, uh, focused on, on, a, on maybe the Budweiser brand or Miller Coors or some of the imports. And, uh, it, it's just difficult to get, get and keep their attention 
to market our product. It does sell, it, but it, you've got to get it on the shelf for the consumer. And, and we struggle with that in, in some cases, not in all cases. You know, There's some, some guys that do very well with our brand. Our brand's very profitable to the bureau wholesaler and to a retailer. You know, it, it's funny because you're so focused. I mean, in, in a day of, you know, right now everybody goes to get their MBAs and then they want to kind of uh, expand globally all over the place. For for 200 years, you've been on the East Coast. Like you went from Pennsylvania to slowly the rest of the East Coast. Why don't you expand nationally? You're already the largest. You would be like 10 times the largest. Well, capacity issues. I mean, we, we, we don't we don't jump into things and build a, uh, or build or buy a five million barrel brewery because we don't we don't feel that uh, we're going to get to that kind of market share that would warrant that. Uh, you know, transportation's a big thing uh, in in any industry today to get your product to the consumer. Uh, if you're selling beer in uh, Colorado. Uh, it probably costs you three thousand dollars a truckload, or maybe three dollars a case to get it there, and it puts our brand out of out of our price range where we want to sell it at. We want to try to play financially, uh, price wise, with uh, with the national brands. And at our size, it's very difficult to do it, but we do it through what I talked about before: efficiencies. So, 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 why don't you buy or build a brewery in Colorado, for instance? Who's going to run it? You have a, a very difficult time getting people to to uh, run a brewery of, of uh, say, a million and a half barrels or two million barrels. Uh, that's basically why. You, you couldn't, like, for instance, um, poach someone from Miller or Sam Adams or whatever. You couldn't couldn't get one of those guys who's already an expert. You probably could if you really searched, but uh, you know, you don't. Ha- we don't have to be the biggest. You know, right. that, that's not our goal. Our goal is to be profitable, to be able to invest in uh, our company. It's, it's going back into uh, 1999, uh, we were growing tremendously, and we only had the one, one brewery, the old, the old plant, and uh, we were strapped for capacity. There's, we don't have a – we're landlocked. We don't have any room to build. So we made the decision to uh, build a new plant about two miles from the old plant, uh, uh, in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And at the same time, the Stroh family decided they were going to get out of the brewing end of the business. And, and uh, they had a, t- a plant of- available in Tampa, Florida that we bought. It was a million and a half barrel capacity. And uh, everybody thought I was nuts for buying it. And uh, you, you know what? It supplemented our production to, to keep us uh, supplied to keep our customers supplied up in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, which is about all the further we were in those days. Uh, so we, uh, as time went on, we got the new uh, brewery going, and then we started to expand our marketing area. But when we expand, we expand in adjacent states. So we go from Pennsylvania to Maryland to Virginia to the Carolinas, and uh, we now we work north from Florida and Alabama and Georgia out of Tampa. So that's our that was our plan, and we we never varied from it. So that's why we really don't open a whole lot of new markets. What, uh, what do you think? We, what do you think ahead. your daughters will do differently than you? So your daughters are going to take know, over after know. you. I don't know. <laughs> they, are you scared? Uh, I think they understand why we do what we do. Uh, they're both very focused on on their jobs in the brewery. One's in administration, the other one's in uh, order services and, pro- and production. She figures all the production. She gets the orders from the wholesalers. And uh, then we, sh- we she puts our production venues together up here in Pottsville. And uh, sh- they do a good job with it. And uh, it, it's, it's uh, I, I must say they're, do- they're, they're, they're doing a great job and the fact that they understand that we have to have our product. And, you know, if, if we start getting really busy and we get a, a big market share in a given market, it's, it's difficult to fulfill the, the demand for our product sometimes. So, you know, they're, they're not going to want to build a brewery, I don't think. If they want to, that's, that's up to them. Every generation has its own... Uh, uh, goals and uh, what they think they can do with the company. I just don't want to see them make a mistake. So, so I kind of, I kind of, the takeaway I'm kind of getting is you sort of found 
your ideal place where you could have a monopoly, which is basically the eastern United States bit by bit. You never went out there and tried to overextend and battle competition. You tried to stay away from the competition so you can focus on being profitable in the areas that already loved you as opposed to kind of stretching past your boundaries. Uh, that's correct. That's pretty much correct. We we tried that in, in a fashion that when we bought the Tampa facility, and 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 people really don't know who we we are when you get into uh, uh, markets that are far away from home. Uh, we couldn't even get a wholesaler in the state of Florida to talk to us. We got a couple of small guys uh, down there, and and they kind of raised their eyebrows, and I told them what I think they could sell, and and uh, you know what, what I told them came true. And uh, eventually they got bought out by larger wholesalers, and now they're jo- enjoying the fruits of our our investments. Well, did you ever feel like selling out? Like I, I read somewhere that your 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 stake in in uh, Yingling Beer is probably worth over you know well over a billion dollars. Like clearly, it might be fun for you to sell out at some point. I have no plans, and I didn't work all these years to sell it. That's uh, and and that number is is strictly a, a figment of somebody's imagination. I nobody ever came in and offered me that kind of money, and I wouldn't sell it anyway. And I think people realize we're not for sale. Kind of frustrates a, a potential buyer, though. Yes, I, do, do you get the calls? Well, I've had inquiries. Yeah. I've had in- inquiries from people. I mean, a lot of it's capital investment groups, and uh, uh, they they know we're doing well, and they know that there's a, a certain value to our name and the fact that we're America's oldest brewery. They know that there's great potential there. And they probably wonder why we don't want to be a national brand, and I don't think we we don't have to be a national brand. I think that's a hard thing for entre- entrepreneurs to realize that they don't have to do everything. That's exactly right. We don't, we don't need it all. Uh, uh, we're fine where we are. We want to grow our market share in, in existing markets. Uh, there's a long way to go. We, we, you know, we only get like a, a three to five to eight share. Maybe in Pennsylvania, we're, we're a, a 10 share of market. And, and you know, we're, not a, we're not as big in the markets that we're in as people think. But we're growing, and uh, our, our our position is we want to grow further. Uh, we we've got the tools to do it. Uh, we've got the name, we've got the products, and uh, we have opportunities to grow in our existing markets. So why do we want to go out to uh, St. Louis and go eyeball to eyeball with the Budweiser brand in uh, Missouri? Yeah, it's interesting because P- Peter Thiel, who's the the founder of PayPal, he was on my show a few months ago, and he basically said that competition is actually bad for capitalism because capitalism is about making profits, and competition takes away the profits. So if you're an entrepreneur, try to do everything you can to become a monopoly in your area as opposed to compete with everyone else. And and it sounds like that's what you're doing. Well, we're we're anything but a monopoly. I mean, at that market share, we're not we're not a monopoly. If right. anything, uh, Anheuser Busch Company is a monopoly. They have almost fifty percent of the uh, nation's beer business. The fact is that they're internationally owned because the Bush family isn't involved anymore, uh, which was kind of startling to me. But uh, it's the way it worked out. And the you know, the Miller's owned by by uh, South African breweries out of London, and uh, and Coors is now run by. Uh, the Molson Company out of Canada. So, you know, here we are standing here, a small brewery in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, that's the largest American-owned brewery in the country. So when the Bush family sold, did you, like, call them up and say, hey, what are you doing? Like, were you guys all friends? <laughs> well, I never met the Bush family. Uh, really? You, you uh, guys are all are the main players in this space? You've never, like, there, there was never, like, a big beer party? Uh, no, I, they 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 were so much bigger than us. I don't I don't think they knew we existed. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, I've never met them. I never met uh, August or his son. And uh, you know, they were an iconic company, and it was just strange to see that happen to them. Uh, the takeover by InBev, and now the company's run entirely different than the way the 
the the Bush family ran it. They were they were very good at running their breweries. They were they uh, those guys make good beer. I mean, there's nothing wrong with their products. Uh, it's it's just that they 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 want it all, and that's not the position we take. How are their breweries run differently now? Well, there's a lot less people there. I mean, you you have to you have to interview some people from St. Louis to see how how what I'm talking about. But uh, there's a lot of people that uh, were there for a lifetime, and uh, they're not there anymore. So, so part, so part of again, what I'm seeing is a, a takeaway is part of what has allowed you guys to go past the shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves phenomenon is in three generations is uh, loyalty to the people who are who are working there. You've kept people there. You've kept families there essentially for for 200 years. Basically, that's true. You know, I have uh, sons of uh, daughters of people that uh, used to work here when I when I started. Did 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 you ever feel like like when you were like eighteen? Did you ever feel like, oh no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fulfill this, you know, almost destiny for me. I'm gonna go off and be a, a, a stockbroker or a Wall Street guy or something like that. I I never had the education or the or the interest in doing uh, such a thing. Uh, I was always focused on the brewery. I, I went to I went to uh, high school. Uh, locally, and when I uh, in the summertime, I worked at the brewery. After after high school, I, uh, I I tried college, and I come home and work at the brewery in the summertime. And uh, as uh, as time went on, I quit college and 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 uh, focused on the brewery. And that that's when I ran into trouble with my father, and I ended up in the army for uh, a six six year stint in the reserve unit. Uh, but that was okay. It was a great experience. I admire what these kids are doing today in the service. So I mean, I, I you know I had my battles with my with my father, but uh, ultimately I ended up getting what I wanted, which was uh, running the brewery, and everything seems to have worked out so far. You know, it's funny about like you mentioned the service and what what you know what these kids are doing today in the service. And I know you were you were a delegate for um, George. W. Bush at one of the Republican conventions, but now how do you feel? Barack Obama, his favorite beer is Yingling beer. Like he sent a, a case of your beer to the Prime Minister of Canada. Like it, it, uh, it's across yeah. politics. Uh, there's no reason he shouldn't want to promote our products. Uh, as I said, it's uh, American owned, and that uh, he should be promoting our products. Yes, we appreciate it, but uh, he doesn't have to. What what um what prevents you from say, now that you like the hardest thing when starting a new drink is getting a getting shelf space in the stores but you've got the shelf space so what stops you from let's say bottling water or going into some other drink to expand that way you know so not necessarily expanding horizontally but vertically uh, we don't need to. I'm I'm focused on the beer industry and uh, there's people in the water water business Nestle. Coca-Cola's in the water business. We, we don't want to play against them. Uh, they stay out of the beer business, and we stay out of the water business. Is basically what I, my philosophy. Let them alone. We don't. We don't have to be all things to all people. We I mean, just want to make good beer and survive. That's all. So, so like for a beginning entrepreneur, I feel like many entrepreneurs start off. And they kind of want to make a product that everybody in the world is going to use. And sometimes that works, like Facebook or Google. But often it fails. And I think people don't often don't have your attitude where um, let's find something really good that a few people will use and love. And then we could build from that point. Well, at the start of our conversation, you said beer has been around. For, you know, the Mesopotamians, I think, did, right. discovered beer. The Chinese years, years and years, centuries ago, discovered beer. So hopefully, it'll be around forever. And uh, we just, ha I just happen to land in a business that uh, uh, it, it, it's a beverage of moderation. Uh, you don't have to drink it all in one day or one sitting. And uh, uh, we make a good product, and uh, you know we, we can we can survive very very well doing what we're doing. And and um, as far as you know, the daughters will continue the tradition. They won't. They pro as far as you could tell, they probably won't sell the business. They'll they'll just keep going, and keep working at it. Uh, they. I have uh, nine grandchildren. <laughs> uh, they're all twelve years old on down. Uh, 
So I don't have anybody really ready at that, that level to come into the brewery, but hopefully they'll uh, realize what they have here and, uh, and uh, the children of my, my, my children. <laughs> and, uh, someday. I probably won't be around when that happens, but uh, I might be. You know, yeah, no. you never know. And That's right. You know, how have you um, enjoyed the fruits of your labor? Like, obviously, you've worked very hard for, for a long time. How, how do you, uh, you know, you've, you've been very successful. How do you enjoy it? Well, I, I enjoy working. Uh, I enjoy seeing the people come in and going through on the tour and how enthusiastic they are about our brand. Um, I, don't, I don't think anybody, any other brewer really uh, enjoys enjoys it as much as I do from due to the fact uh, uh, that we're around 185 years and uh, you know that's that speaks for itself there's a lot of new players in the in the beer industry and uh, you know they're they're doing well uh, it's craft craze is is interesting to me and uh, I wish I wish all of them well I mean there's uh, as I, I said before, three brewers control 85% of the beer business in the United States. So there's a lot of room for guys like us, even at our level of uh, just below 3 million barrels. There's a lot of uh, room for new customers out there, and hopefully we get some of them. So, so one 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 final question, which is which is more of a fun one. But when you were like 17 or 18, were you like? king of the hill in high school because you were o- you probably were always the source of beer at the parties <laughs> well i was that that that's true uh but i never felt uh being as as though i was king of the hill i don't forget our company at that time was really struggling so uh, i never i never had that attitude and i still don't you know the uh, you're up against we're up against some big competition and uh, I'm not afraid of them. Uh, we're just trying to steal a little piece of their business to keep ourselves alive and keep our people working. And what, when were you most stressed in the, in the business? Probably when I was trying to get my father to build a warehouse so we could uh, uh, palletize the operation and operate efficiently. efficiently. Did you stop uh, talking for a while or anything? Well, we, we had a, a stressed relationship. But, uh, you know, when you get a little older, you realize that, you know, you're asking him to spend money that he doesn't have. And uh, I knew he didn't at that time. Uh, but I looked at it as a gamble. And that's what, what uh, business is. It's a risk. And being in business is risky. You know, you're you're putting out a lot of money to do a lot of things in a brewery. And, and uh, it, it's risky. But uh, I have confidence in our our uh, products. I have confidence in the in our in our people that they'll sell our products, and I have, have confidence in the consumer that they'll they'll like our products. And uh, I see a great future for us. Well, that's great, D- Dick Yingling. Thank you so much for for spending the time to come on to my podcast. I know you're you're super busy, and uh, it's a great beer. Uh, when I told people I was interviewing you, a hundred percent of the people said, "Oh, I tell them I drink their beer," and that's from <laughs> that's from Florida to Maine. So well, pe- people drink that's, you. That's very nice uh, uh, of you to say that, and I appreciate everybody's support, and uh, I appreciate you calling me and uh, having me on your show. Okay, Th- thanks a lot, Dick. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, Jim. Thank Bye. you. Bye bye. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Building a stronger financial foundation? Good plan. Northwestern Mutual's Guide to Good Financial Planning can help you balance spending and saving, set goals, and start creating the life you want to be living. 
you'll learn how the tools in your financial plan reinforce each other to help you minimize taxes and offset potential risks. Grow your confidence by strengthening your finances today at northwesternmutual.com slash good plan. The Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin.